to in connection with the <clears throat> batch distillation at the end of the last period, and so I'll just briefly refer to them. Uh, the first is how do you calculate the <clears throat> average composition of a distillate for batch distillation? I, I, I imagine you figure this out by now by yourself, but but nevertheless, if you have <clears throat> a batch that you take, which we designate L1 with a composition of X1, <clears throat> at the start, and then after a certain period of time, you end up with a <clears throat> uh, lesser volume, a uh, decreased volume of, di of liquid of a composition X2. And uh, in the meantime, you've produced a certain amount of distillate how much is that distillate? Well, the distillate, of course, the volume of it has to be, the distillate is in the amount, either volume or mass, mass is a more fundamental basis, <clears throat> is equal to the difference between the original and final and final amounts of uh, uh, liquid in the pot. So in other words, if we want to write down the average composition of the distillate, of a batch type distillate, <clears throat> well, I suppose one could get an estimate of it by, as some people indicate they did by taking the vapor liquid equilibrium curve and estimate what the initial distillate composition is. When the composition is X1, X1 you can look up the equilibrium data, Y1. When it gets down to X2, you can look it up, look up what Y2 would be, equilibrium. The, uh, and the, that average won't give you the right answer, but it'd be, some, it'd be in the general vicinity. It'd be somewhere in between, naturally. But they, it's not, it wouldn't be the true average but composition of this distillate because um, it doesn't come off at a uniform rate. Or in other words, the, uh, I mean, the uh, composition doesn't change the linear It changes in some other fashion. <clears throat> so anyway, the average composition of distillate, which sometimes we write Y bar to show us an average, would of course be equal to the amount of the more volatile component recovered in the distillate, which was which we get by difference, by taking the difference between the amount originally present in the liquid minus the amount remaining in the in the remaining liquid. <clears throat> so this represents the amount distilled, doesn't it? All right, the composition then but of course, it would be that fraction of the amount of the liquid. So the amount, the amount of distillate, rather, the amount of distillate is equal to L1 minus L2. So that's all there is to that. And secondly, we might want to write down uh, <clears throat> percent recovery in the distillate, percent recovery of a volatile component in the distillate. And so again, the numerator of this would be the same. Percent would be equal to the amount in the distillate. L1, L1, X1, minus L2, X2, divided by what? L1, X1, the, amount of, the initial amount, L1, X1. Of course, that's a fraction recovered times 100 if you want to get express it as percent. <coughs> So you know, that, that was something I overlooked mentioning last time, which uh, you really needed to, needed to solve uh, the problem that I, the first problem on that problem set. Incidentally, I guess I ask you to hand in the second and third problems today. Um, and then the, and problem number one on tomorrow. <clears throat> now, um, Anybody have any questions or difficulties with these problems? Hmm? <laughs>
there? <laughs> For a batch distillation, this would be the percent recovery. I think that's, I think I, I've forgotten that. I think that's part of problem one anyway, isn't it? Yes, okay, it's part, also part of <coughs> two, part B, I asked for a similar such, sort of expression. What did you, what did you get for uh, the answer to um, part A of problem one? Where which, which ask about the, um, what is the concentration of isohemal alcohol in both the distillate and the residual liquid? Well, you need the, you need the first relationship here to answer that. Anybody have the result? Hmm? Question two, part A. First of all, what is the concentration of isohemal alcohol in the, um, well, let's say in the residual liquid? That'd be X2. What'd you get? Okay, 0.014 percent. I think that's. Point oh one four oh or point oh one three nine six if you want to get carried out to the uh, bitter bitter end. <laughs> what percent? Uh, what did you get as the average composition then of uh, this distillate? Did you get that? Four point eight seven. Okay, that's correct. That's correct. <clears throat> <laughs> How about part B? What percentage of isolating alcohol was recovered in the distillate? Percent recovery? 97 what? <laughs> okay. That's good. <laughs> what, what, if you did that, if you treated the same material in flash distillation, problem three, what would have been the concentration of amyl alcohol in the, dis in the uh, distillate? What'd you get? What's it get? Okay, I think that's about right. In other words, it's a, <clears throat> it's a little bit lower, a little bit lower than, um, than by back distillation. How about the percentage of recovery? How much did you get? All right, good. So in other words, you get less less percent recovered by a, this kind of a, by the continuous <coughs> continuous single stage distillation than you do by a batch distillation by a factor of about ninety seven and a half down to seventy nine point six. Yeah. I don't quite understand the question. The same process, the analogous process to a splash evaporation process to run at a low temperature. And assuming we wanted to save this stuff and it was damaged, we could have run the pot spill into a vacuum condenser with the same 97% efficiency. Well, roughly so. Uh, uh, there is some vapor liquid equilibrium data for ethyl alcohol water at low at low pressures. I haven't given you that. I've got it in my files, uh, and it and it's a little different, but it's not significantly different from the atmosphere. Vacuum condenser, and we had a choice of recovering these two products, the product one or two ways, and we didn't want to damage it. The pot still would have been more economical in a throttling process. Have been be more effective, been more complete. <coughs> well, from, from by evaporating the same amount, why well, uh, batch distillation is a little more complete. Okay. That's it. Uh, 
Well, that depends on other things. <laughs> Cheaper. Cheaper. Um, batch distillation, or uh, batch processes in general are more expensive than, than, uh, than continuous processes, particularly uh, labor, and usually the Usually you can't recuperate energy as well either because it's more batch, whereas in um, con continuous processes you can usually uh, have uh, heat exchangers where you recover a certain amount of the energy and maybe use it for some other purpose or use it in preheating and feeds and so on, which is a little more difficult to do in batch processes. There's advantages and disadvantages and, uh, and uh, in small scale operations, at least, uh, uh, mass distillation is a little bit more easy. It's somewhat easier to, con to control and regulate and, and carry out. Whereas, um, or for varied requirements of distilling, batch is somewhat simpler to use than, uh, than a continuous. But a continuous is more efficient of labor and, and, and energy if you have a um, sufficient volume of requirement and, uh, and uh, have proper control so that you maintain a uniform operation. And um, uh, these reasons I'm stating now have not particularly any relationship to quality. Uh, so quality factors, another matter, flavors. <coughs> as far as brandy production is concerned, um, there are those that believe that the <coughs> Batch distillation gives you a much more more complex mixture and therefore desirable to, for, for brandy or whiskey distillation. This is a view held, of course, in Cognac, France, where they used the process for a couple hundred years and not about to change right now. <laughs> and Scotland also, but <clears throat> which has not been applied here in the United States because the continuous distillation is simpler to carry out. Do oh, you have a question? Uh -huh. um, with the second distillation of cognac, can you take the heads cut? Um, don't get rid of fuse oil components like this. Is that because they're soluble in the alcohol? Because here we've got a 97% recovery of the, the isolanum in the first tenth. And so that's like the same as taking your heads cut with the first fraction that comes over. But here it was very volatile, but making cognac it wouldn't be volatile because of the alcohol? Is that why you can't? Well, it's less volatile because of the alcohol present. And um, I don't have any data here, but we've, met, we've taken data as a, and, ran the, and have run the fusel oil contents of the initial distillate and subsequent fractions there, there, thereafter. <clears throat> so in the second distillation, or the Boon Schulf, as it's called, of cognac production. The higher alcohol is, uh, the content is greater at the start and then declines during the run. But it's not sufficiently sharp separation that you get any appreciable removal. This is relatively sharp in the example. It would be here because uh, we're dealing with water solution where you have a very high volatility in pure water solution. Okay, so the purpose of taking the heads cut off and the second distillation of cognac is to eliminate aldehydes and things. It's not <clears throat> I still had intended to take a period and I go into the cognac production in somewhat more detail, but uh, but in effect, about the only purpose taking the heads cut off in the cognac practice, Charant practice, is flush out the lines. <laughs> <laughs> Flesh out the residue from the previous distillation and the water that may be clinging in the serpentine condenser. Because they add it back to a wine and they redistill it, so they never get rid of anything. Whatever is present is always ends up in the, in the distillate or, or possibly interacts in some way. Some feeling that some of the aldehydes react with with. Um, Components of the wine, and, and uh, anyway, they don't get any particular accumulation of aldehydes by recycling. Mm -hmm. 
uh, <clears throat> you can uh, you can um, hand your problems in today if you want to, but if you want to keep them to Lamar and hand it over to number one, I I just assume you do that. <laughs> but I <clears throat> I thought if I didn't tell you the work problems two and three, you wouldn't do anything to Lamar. Some people wouldn't. So <laughs> so now you got an easy job for Lamar to finish the number one problem. Also, just for your record here, there's a little better drawing of the of that principle I showed on the board last time of uh, the two general methods of of operating a pot rectifier. The first would be figure one. It's uh, as I indicated, constant reflux ratio. This little drawing I'm handing out here. <laughs> shows the instantaneous liquid tray and distillate compositions for four ideal stages at three different pot liquid compositions. Well, the, uh, that maybe that maybe that title isn't quite correct, but in three pot liquid compositions for the liquid <laughs> for liquid at at point at, at point of time number one, number two, and number three. Of course, x one, x two, and x three would be the corresponding distillate compositions. You can read them off here what they are, but they um, were x, of course, plotted on the horizontal axis. This is what now D three comes off first. No, D1. Normally, D1 would be the first one. If if L1 represents the initial concentration or the initial liquid, why uh, at this reflux ratio indicated by this slope of the operating line, you'd have a D1 composition. At some point later in time, when the composition of the pot had decreased down to down to where the where the liquid is, is at L2. And it would have an X composition X2, if you want to call it that. You would get what's indicated on the diagram here is D2 at the same reflux ratio. Similarly, in state three, you'd have a, L, a composition here integrated by L3 would give you a distillate of, a, of D3. And so the aggregate would be some average of this. <clears throat> and, and, I gave you something else. I, was, I wanted to have another. Yeah. Okay. So in Figure Two shows uh, th three separate charts, which shows a um, um, situation of trying to operate at constant product composition by increasing the reflux ratio uh, during the course of a run. The top chart showing the well, all the alt charts showing X of D here as a desired product composition. So with four equilibrium stages, uh, this would be obtained at a fairly low reflux ratio indicated by the top chart of this figure two. A little when the, when the composition in the pot would be L1, the liquid be, would be L1, and a little later in time when it's down to L2, you could obtain this distillate at a somewhat greater reflux ratio or a slope that's more close to one. And a little later on, it's a little farther down. And of course, eventually, as I said before, uh, you, you'd have a, when the reflux ratio was essentially one or the, down the, the operating line would coincide the diagonal, you'd have the minimum composition in the pot liquid, which would give you a distillate X of D. <clears throat> Any questions about this, these two charts? This is in, in both cases, this is the same run at different, at, uh, different times. During change, in the, this is just changes in the liquid potting. The... Well, I, I, it, it really just illustrates the principle. I'm not sure where these figures here are, are consistent. Oh, well, whether L1, L2, and L3 are exactly the same as they are here or not, I don't think so. I think it's just drawn to show uh, a principle involved. Yeah, what is the same? 
I'm just wondering, like on this first on this first uh, graph, that this is one batch distillation showing from the beginning down. To yeah, the during a passage of time. That's what that's what they represent in in both cases. <clears throat> now, I hadn't. Um, didn't know that was attached here, but uh, since I guess, did everybody get a copy of this then? <laughs> since I was, going, I was going to hand it out a little later, but since you got it, that's fine. Um, so what I was going to discuss next was um, some aspects of fusel oil, particularly from the standpoint of um, fusel oil separation and decantation during distillation. <clears throat> and um, <coughs> I would mention that I think in that reserve shelf in the library, I put in a couple, some reprints about fusel oil. I'll go in there and check to make sure I did. But anyway, uh, there's a couple I think that I don't have copies to hand out, but I may give you some next time. Maybe I'll give you an, an extract of the table out of one or two of them. <clears throat> but anyway, I might mention what uh, <clears throat> a couple references here that have to do with fusel oil separation or fusel oil separation by distillation and decantation. And, uh, and the first one is uh, one I wrote <coughs> Back in 1958, and it, had, and it, it, has, it has a title: "Principles of Fusel Oil Separation and Decantation," <clears throat> and it's uh, an American Journal of Enology, volume nine, number one, and pages 64 to 73, 1958. <clears throat> then uh, another one, a couple of years later. <clears throat> The journal now becomes American Journal of Enology and Viticulture in the meantime. <laughs> <clears throat> and that's volume uh, 11, number, th number 3, page 105 to 112, 1960. And this paper has to do with the composition of plate samples from distilling columns with and the distribution of constituents on the plates with, with special emphasis on higher alcohols. Uh, maybe that wasn't the exact title, but it's close. Yeah. Composition of plate samples from distilling columns with particular reference to the distribution of higher alcohols. Well, um, I think we've had, we've had occasion already to talk uh, a time or two about the uh, fusel oil and the fact that there is a term applied to a mixture of higher alcohols. I, th I think Mr. Kroll discussed the general composition, didn't he, of fusel oils, the alcohols that make up the mixture. And uh, <clears throat> um, I don't know what, uh, what else he told you about it. That, uh, that's, but but the, these alcohols are products of alcoholic fermentation. And uh, the, the theory that was held for a long time was that they were breakdown products of, a, of amino acids. And uh, this, date, this view was held from, uh, since about 1910 uh, or 11, uh, when um, a man by the name of Ehrlich in Germany did a whole series of classic um, experiments and publications to clear up this question. It had been debated over a period of a century without, uh, very, without very conclusive <clears throat> results. <clears throat> so this view held for many, 
for a long time until within the last 20 years, I suppose, um, it, was, it began to be some question about this being a completely uh, rational explanation. <clears throat> because we found out that after we had methods by which we could analyze for our amino acids in wines or our fermentation media, and the particular amino acids, according to the theory of Ehrlich, was that iso <clears throat> isoamyl alcohol was derived from the breakdown of amino acid leucine. Its isomer active amyl alcohol is, uh, is a product of uh, the isomer leucine called isoleucine. <clears throat> And isobutyl alcohol is derived, from, according to the Ehrlich theory, by the utilization of valine. <clears throat> well, several years ago, um, Professor Castor and I uh, did, carried out some experiments in which we, he was able to measure amino acids, the, these three amino acids, valine, leucine, and isoleucine, during the course of fermentation by a very, uh, at that time, difficult and laborious procedure of microbiological <coughs> assay. But nevertheless, he showed uh, that um, although there is an initial level of, amino a of these three amino acids, they, they, they all three rather rapidly disappear, utilized by the yeast and disappear from the medium. <clears throat> and, um, and, um, well before any significant amount of higher alcohols, the fusel oil have appeared in the medium. The fusel oils appeared, uh, uh, began to appear later as the alcohol is being, as ethyl alcohol is being formed during the most rapid dismutation of sugar, whereas these amino acids disappeared more or less during the growth phase of the yeast, the first 24 hours. <clears throat> Furthermore, calculations the more or less stoichiometric nature showed that that the levels of amino acids determined by our assays was sufficient to account for perhaps only 15 or 20 percent of the total amount of higher alcohols formed. So, <clears throat> so therefore, there had to be some other explanation of the formation of these higher alcohols. Well, it has since been learned uh, that whereas the Ehrlich mechanism is still valid and true that added amino acids, for example, will give enhanced amounts of the particular higher alcohols of which the theory calls for, the point is that <clears throat> The mechanism by which the amino acids would be degraded and uh, converted to higher alcohols involves the <clears throat> involves the um, decarboxylation of the of the acid of the, of the carboxyl group of the amino acid to give a to give a, a, a keto acid. Well, first it involves transamination to give a to give a they give, to give the keto acid, and then the keto acid is broken down by decarboxylation to an aldehyde, which is then reduced to an alcohol. <clears throat> the, it turns out to be that the key compound is the keto acids, the, um, the alpha keto acids, which, as I said, can either be formed by the transamination of the um, amino acid that's present. But in the case of fruit juices, at least, the keto acid is more likely to be formed or is formed more abundantly by the pathway of synthesis of amino acids. After all, yeast can grow without any amino acids. It can synthesize its own requirements from, from inorganic nitrogen. <clears throat> so it, but it does have to have these amino acids, so there is a synthetic pathway. So anyway, the point is that the alpha keto acid is the immediate precursor of the higher alcohols, and whether it's obtained by breakdown of existing amino acids or whether it's formed by the yeast in, in its synthetic mechanisms um, results in the same <coughs> end product. 
I think I think maybe I'll hand you out, hand out a little reprint here of a kind of a popular article I prepared a year or so ago, which um, hits a few high spots about this without going into any detail. And so uh, <clears throat> perhaps for the rest of the period, we'll kind of refer to this little paper. here I refer to some of these points I've already <coughs> referred to. The fact that um, that um, I don't know where I can't find where I mentioned that here but <coughs> I was I, I, I thought I, somewhere in here I mentioned that mm -hmm. Wines traditionally contain somewhere between 25 and 40 milligrams per 100 milliliters at the end of fermentation. White wines a little less than red wines, and uh, full-bodied red wines some uh, somewhat higher, <clears throat> 40 or 50 milligram percent. In fact, I can recognize the odor of amyl alcohol when it gets up to about 40 milligram percent in wine. Gives it a certain style of pungency. <clears throat> well, so uh, uh, there is a little reference here on that page two or page 38 of this um, paper in which I gave a little brief scheme here of the of uh, reactions leading to isoamyl amyl alcohol by breakdown of alpha-ketoisocaproic alpha acid. And I also show how it can be formed by transamination with, from, the, from the leucine <coughs> existing. So uh, I don't want to take too much time uh, this morning talking about factors affecting the formation, but uh, I've discussed it here. That the <coughs> for reasons we don't completely understand, uh, uh, the, the influence of composition of the medium on the amount that ends up, probably the reason is we never have an adequate picture of the composition of the medium. We um, um, know for, we do know that the <clears throat> that uh, different m media can give levels varying uh, from uh, 10 to 50 percent more or less than the, than another variety, or even the same uh, different pickings of the same variety it may vary somewhat like that. But anyway, that was a that was a rather obscure, and probably has to do with the nitrogen makeup of the medium. But we don't know what they are. Usually, we don't have time or the equipment to analyze them exhaustively. Temperature fermentation is a very important factor, and the table one here gives a very brief summary of some work that we did where we use five, five different temperatures from 50 to 91 degrees. And it shows there that ice flame alcohol is a, of the alcohols is most affected by temperature. And, and, um, and unfortunately, uh, from a practical standpoint, the maximum formation of ice flame alcohol is about the optimum temperature of fermentation around 70 to 80 degrees, or roughly about 75. <clears throat> which for production of distilling material would seem to be what the figure that you'd kind of like to use. But as it turned out, it, it's, a, it's a temperature at which you'll get the maximum formation of higher alcohols, particularly the, the isoamyl alcohol and to a certain extent the active amyl. The next line on that table. The isobutyl and isopropyl are a little affected by temperature. In fact, it seems that according to our result that there's a slight inverse effect on, uh, on, the, for, on the percentage of normal propyl. <clears throat> but anyway, I mentioned here many other things that you can do. <clears throat> you know, for example, if you add 
if you add a m inorganic nitrogen, such as ammonium salts, to a medium, you will you'll tend to decrease the amount of higher alcohols formed. Um, interestingly enough, uh, some grape juices uh, that form relatively low levels are a little affected by adding amino nitrogen, I mean uh, inorganic nitrogen, presumably because they have already enough ammonia present and um, or other or have a more <clears throat> well distributed nitrogen pattern in the, in the composition. Whereas there occasionally you run across some grape juices or must that produce very high levels of higher alcohols. In that case, the addition of amino acids, not amino acids, but um, ammonium salts, will markedly cut down, sometimes reduce by 50% the amount of amyl alcohol formed. Is this table one, is that true for like, did you try a whole bunch of different yeasts or is that just for one yeast? <laughs> I think this was uh, this table was a summary of a work, work done with one yeast, but it represented six different varieties of grapes collected from two locations. It represented twelve different musts, and there were, and but the and so the levels varied quite a bit between the wines. But uh, the pattern, as far as the effect of temperature, was. Um, pretty consistent uh, with all of them. The levels may differ, but they, uh, the pattern's the same. Mm -hmm. Now, yeast is another factor, and uh, we would have got some different results if we'd used different yeasts. Uh, that's one of the factors mentioned here at the bottom of this particular page. <clears throat> we have been able to demonstrate in the past uh, considerable differences in yeast strains, but we can all, we also have difficulty reproducing the results, particularly if you change the scale of fermentation. For example, in small scale laboratory fermentations of a half a gallon or a couple liters of must, you can get considerable differences. But I would say this, that generally this widely used Montrachet strain that's used so much in the wine industry and also generally in our pilot plant here for making is a, is a very vigorous yeast and if it almost, uh, you could say that if um, there's going to be differences in higher alcohols formed, it'll produce the highest levels of any ones we study. <clears throat> for that reason, in recent <clears throat> years for our distilling wines, we have preferred to use a so-called champagne strain, which the number there should be 595, I guess, instead of 519, although 519 is a champagne strain, but not the one we use, <clears throat> because it does give significantly lower levels if the effect of yeast has an effect. Well, I don't want to go into, too, into this in too much, of, too much, but I mentioned here, besides um, temperature fermentation, yeast strain, and nitrogen, and where I mentioned suspended solids, that um, whatever you can do to use a relatively clear juice will give you lower levels in general. Also, the presence of the skins or, or um, suspended fiber materials will enhance the amount formed. Apparently, because of the some composition supply, <coughs> some some composition effect of the suspended materials, but also uh, apparently oxidative it tends to enhance the um, transfer of oxygen. So oxidative conditions or aeration would then tends to enhance the amount of higher alcohols formed. So I mentioned here that uh, one of the practices you sometimes see or used to see anyway in the, in the bulk wineries for mixing is to use compressed air. They have an opening in the bottom, have a pipe leading into the bottom of the tank and then bubble in compressed air and it will, it is a fairly effective mixing in the tank. It'll, uh, and, but anyway, this would appear to be a rather bad practice. Uh, <coughs> Not only form aldehyde, but forms more fusilol too. Yes? On suspended solids, um, if you centrifuge your wine, <coughs> the um, spinning action, it might tend to break up proteins in the wine. Could that add to amino acids? It, uh, it may remove them in 
this sludge if you uh, if you centrifuge it. So as a matter of fact, this is I'm sure if you centrifuge the juice as we have done, you get lower fusel oils. And so that's one reason I suggest in the practical distilling material formation, if your objective, as usually is, to reduce fusel oil formation, <clears throat> is to use as clear a juice as possible, and uh, frequently this is obtained, uh, reasonably obtained by crushing in a tank and then after 12, 24 hours draining off the juice. It's a lot clearer than when you try to separate the juice immediately by running across drag screens over perforated, uh, perforated screens, that sort of thing. So uh, whatever me mechanisms and economic economically feasible techniques you have of getting a relatively clear juice, this will give you a lower fusel oil formation. The, the Ehrlich pathway requires reduced NADH, uh, requires NADH, and then here for the alternate pathway, it, it's got a reduction step two. The, <clears throat> they were, the reduction or the breakdown of a, of a keto acid to give the alcohol uh, is not an alternate pathway. I mean, that, uh, that alternate pathways lead to this common intermediate, which is broken down. The same reaction would apply. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah, oh, okay, but, but that's still, okay, I thought with this pathway, maybe there wouldn't be as, you wouldn't need as much of a reduction potential, but, but, but you still have reduction taking place. <laughs> And so aeration. Well, the, the, the actual uh, the, uh, the biochemistry of the effect of aeration is not very well understood, at least by me. And um, actually, it has more effect on, on isobutyl alcohol than it does on the amyl alcohol, but um, <clears throat> it affects the amyl alcohol too. But aeration tends to affect the uh, isobutyl more than the amyl for some reason or other. Well, it may have some effect, but I don't think it'd be very significant because most of the fusel oil is formed after the growth phase is finished and uh, during the time when uh, it's converting the carbohydrates to alcohol. The, uh, if there's been some studies made, and we've made some, on what you determine the ratio of higher alcohols to ethanol. And uh, some people got some results that show it's formed earlier or later, but <clears throat> as far as I can say, it's more or less constant ratio, more or less constant ratio. So the same, <clears throat> same pro well, probably the same enzymes or very closely related enzymes that are causing the reduction of, uh, of acetaldehyde to ethanol. Are, are reducing uh, isovaloraldehyde to have ethanol, the immediate precursors of the higher alcohols. This, so, another question? Yeah, this is just for um, Randy. On table wine, it's, uh, the fusel oil wouldn't say influenced it except where you can, you said you could uh, detect the amyl alcohol at about 40? Yeah. Is that, is that a uh, negative aspect of the wine? Well, it's a matter of interpretation, for example. I think, I think the variety of Cabernet Sauvignon, to get off on a tangent now, <clears throat> which has grown in California, uh, frequently is, is the, the aroma associated with Cabernet is, is re relatively, uh, is that of a one that's relatively high in alcohol. My tasting, I refer to it as the amyl tone. <laughs> That's my right, uh, tasting. <clears throat> well, I, uh, I I got onto this a good many years ago when I we were we were an analyzing a whole series of commercial wines, some two or three hundred, I guess it was, um, for um, higher alcohols, and um, and there was a. Um, and, and incidentally, these, these particular wines that we, we worked with, this, 
year, 20 years ago or so, were ones that had been submitted to the state fair for competition. So they're all brought over here. <clears throat> and so some of them I had been on the judging panel, and so I had my tasty notes to look for. And I remember particularly there was one Zinfandel that I had um, said um, tastes like fusel oil or an amyl alcohol. We analyzed it and it was around 60 milligram percent, the highest of any table wine in the, sit in the, in the uh, <clears throat> group. So um, I was sure then that my uh, taste was correct. And later on, I've done that several other times, and it's somewhere around 40 percent. You can tell flavor by taste. This is not. Uh, this doesn't. Is this uh, specific for like Zinfandel and Cabernet, or are there other varieties that will just? Well, red wines in general, and particularly the more robust wines, uh, heavier bodied wines. Um, but um, I don't know. This uh, there's no great. Uh, thing made of it uh, that I know of. Uh, whether it's good or bad, it's still a little controversial. You could, I'm, by that same token, though, I think if you use different yeast than Montrachet, you'd get a little different flavor because you'd get a less, uh, less formation of high alcohol, among other at least to get that effect. <clears throat> Well, I think it's most of the composition, but of course, you ferment on the skins in order to get uh, the bulk of the fermentation on the skins in order to get the color and the typical characteristic of red wines, and that, that is a situation that will give you higher levels of the higher alcohols than if you uh, fermented a juice, for example. Like a white wine. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you, can, you can look over those things here, um, but um, I want to turn to the uh, distillation bin aspect. <clears throat> and our time is about up already. <clears throat> what I wanted to, get a, wanted to talk about is the fact that in, the, in distilling beverage brandy, we don't, nor, we don't get we do not have an opportunity. There's no degree of rectification of concentration sufficient on a tray to get any appreciable separation. The table two there shows us some <clears throat> condensation of some results we did of analyzing tray samples from our pilot column over here when we uh, distilled a um, significant amount, uh, at least 50 or 60 gallons of distillate. Um, somewhat more than that, I guess, uh, at three different proofs of distillation from the same wine. So at the proof of distillation of 139, the maximum fusel oil concentration was uh, um, um, shows here 157 grams per 100 liters uh, on, the, on the product tray. Well, I see now why this, why the 139, uh, I mean the 157 disagrees with that 126. No, disagrees with, uh, 126 should agree with 139, but at 139 was the aggregate proof of the whole 60 or 70 gallons of distillate, whereas the time we took the sample, the, the proof on that tray only indicated 126, probably the, taking the plate samples that lowered the proof somewhat. And, uh, <laughs> hmm? Look, it goes, the proof of brandy goes to 170. And no, then, uh, now then, the next, the next line uh, where the proof of distillate was 170, the maximum fusel oil was on tray two, uh, two below the feed, uh, below the product tray, and the proof on that tray was 127. And the fusel oil concentration was about was 444, or about three times as much. At 181, the maximum concentration was a couple of trays farther down, and uh, again about doubled. But the proof on the tray was again around the one, around 131, about the same. Which is somewhat further evidence of the facts that I've already indicated that the maximum fusel oil concentrates uh, proof pretty close to 130. Sometimes we say 135. I think 130 would be a little closer to 135. <clears throat> 
course, you likely have when you draw samples out, if you have a tray that reads 135, the next one may be only read 115, so then it'd be on the one at 135. <laughs> sometimes sometimes you get, you're operating in such a way that maybe there's a tray that's 130, and then the tray below might be only uh, 110 or something like that. So you don't exactly ever hit one that's exactly 130 or so on. Well, <clears throat> on the other hand, so in other words, I point out here that in this particular report that the um, uh, time to point out anyway, that it's almost impo impossible to separate fusel oil because in, uh, as a, in the conventional manner from dist by distillation when your proof of distillation is limited to 170 because you never get any concentration on any tray that would be high enough to separate by a conventional uh, fusel oil separation into two layers. But in concentration to high proof distillates, where the, where the distillation may go up to 192 or so, uh, you, you'll definitely get that. Referring to this, one of these reprints, a reprint of this particular paper I mentioned here, reference number two, you'll find, uh, you'll find first of all, table one, which is which is a more detailed table from which this table one we're just looking at in this paper was extracted. But uh, somewhat more interesting is a rather big table here where, which represents the composition of plate samples taken from a, an industrial column in the Fresno area, which had 38 trays in the concentrating section. <clears throat> we, were able, we were able to get a set of plate samples when, it was, when the column was being used in the first case to produce a high proof spirit or wine spirit. And uh, I think the product tray was about, it was showed 100, 100, <clears throat> between 192 and 193 proof. And uh, then on the right hand side is the same um, set of samples from the corresponding trays when the distillate was being produced at, uh, for beverage brandy purposes. And I think the Records show that at the time the tray samples were taken, the proof of distillation on that, <clears throat> the tray liquid had about 155 proof, I think it was down here. Well, anyway, you can't see this, but if you want to take a chance time to look, uh, look it up, or maybe I'll make a copy of this table for you. You see there the fusel oil level is rather negligible all up in the upper parts of the tray when you're distilling buried brandy. When it gets down here in uh, to the product tray, the maximum here was 121 <clears throat> milligrams per hundred milliliters, and that was on one tray below the product tray <clears throat> in this particular case. And the product tray was only 110. That's, uh, those, so those are the two highest trays in the column. Now look over here in this column, when you're distilling high proof wine spirits, the values are very low up in the upper part of the column where it's 190 proof or more. <clears throat> and then down here along about when the proof gets down to about 188, it's already higher than it is at any value on this beverage type uh, distillation. And gradually it goes up here until um, the last tray that we had that had a, was a homogeneous liquid that had 24% or 24,100 milligrams per, <clears throat> per 100 liters, 100 milliliters, or 24 grams per 100 liters. <clears throat> And then the, then the samples, bottles that I obtained for the four trays lower, there was actually two phases. They separated right in the bottle, by just by cooling down. Or they may have separated before they were, when they were being drawn off. But anyway, by the time they're cooled, they separated in two phases. <clears throat> well, that's a long way. So in this case, they were drawing the product off, as I recall, along about the 10th tray or something like that, and this is down at the 34th to 38th tray measured from the top. You can either look that up if you're interested in the details. <clears throat> but um, I wanted to um, Turn to the principle. I'm, I'm going to have to stop now, but um, the principle of separation involves the fact that isoing alcohol is only partially miscible in water. And I can't remember whether I had when I gave you a copy of this earlier in the quarter or not. Well, anyway, <clears throat> it's a solubility curve for for isoing alcohol in water, 
as a function of temperature, and the lower one is a solubility curve for isobutyl alcohol. I'll make a copy of it and give it to you. But then the, what I handed out here is a, this other chart is a, represents the three-phase system, isoamyl alcohol, ethyl alcohol, and water. A ternary system, the solubility curve at one temperature, 25 degrees centigrade. Up here at the, at the top, the apex is ethanol, and down here it would be pure ethanol up here, down here it would be pure ethyl alcohol, and over here it would be pure water. But at any point in here represents a, com represents a composition of the, th of the three components by reading off the percentage perpendicular to the, to the, um, to the base. <coughs> And uh, this represents the solubility curve. In the region above this line here, there's, there's only one phase present. And down here, there are two phases. <clears throat> Below the curve, there are two phases. And these tie lines, they're called, uh, connect the compositions which are in equilibrium with each other. And so we're going to use this to work a problem that I'll probably begin and bring in tomorrow to a couple of problems to illustrate the principle. Generally, when you draw up a sample from a <clears throat> tray in a column, uh, you'll have some value which is in, 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 the, in the miscible range, the soluble range. The only way you can get it to separate it is to, is to cool it down to this temperature and, and, and dilute it with water. The effect of diluting with water is to change the composition on a lot, straight line headed toward the <clears throat> pure water. And so if you're able to get it, get it over far enough so that it intersects and goes below this curve, then you'll get two phases separated. So that's, and we can actually do it quantitatively using isoamyl alcohol, ethanol, and water as a kind of a model system. <clears throat> so that's all we've got time for. In fact, we're a little bit too